And oh man, good stuff, huh? How many are just excited that uh, you get to be alive on the earth today, huh? Come on. Got a couple of you that are really happy you're alive. After Resurrection Sunday, come on, let's give it up for Jesus being raised from the dead. It's good. I don't know, I kind of tell a difference. Uh, we were outside in, in uh, Thumb Butte for Easter Sunday, and I can tell a difference in the countenance of the church. It's like, we're back in the building. We have to be the building people. We, we're, we're in a church. Well, we're not in a church building. We're in a building. We're in a box. How many know there's a, there's a difference? Do you feel it? you feel it? I don't know what, how we do, how we get past that. Uh, but I do know that last Sunday was amazing. It was just great to be outside. Can I hear a good amen? amen. And then yesterday, uh, we, we had 10 of us on the river, and I thought, I feel like I'm home again. All right, Kevin? Feel like Bruce? I mean, Bruce and Sarah, this is the first time on a river. First time on a river. In a kayak, right. It was a speedboat before that. So cool. You used the Sewell's kayak, and you said that thing is a dream. You want to buy it from them. So cool. It's something... It's something with, like this morning and then yesterday and last week. I'm talking about the dynamics in the room and the dynamics outside. There, there's something about the dynamics. And that's what I'm going to talk about today because this is Earth Day weekend. And so don't, you know, like we all get all kind of, I know religious people get all kind of freaky when you start talking about Earth Day. But actually, Earth Day was initiated by a Pentecostal Assemblies of God pastor in the 1970s, went to Congress, and they made it as a national, and it became an international recognized event, Earth Day. He's written many, John O'Connell has written many books on preparing a, 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 and being good stewards of the earth. But he thought there needed to be a day that we shut down our concrete, metal, lit, illuminated world for a minute and think about the earth. And so I want to talk about that today, and I, I hope I offend some of you, uh, because I probably will. But it's not me that's offending. God's word is replete with stories of the earth and the message of the earth. I think it was... Um, it was somebody that said... I was going to say Teddy Roosevelt, but it wasn't him. Said that we build our buildings, and then our buildings build us. And I know that's true about church world. We spend billions and billions of dollars on buildings. Hello? Hello? The real estate of the religious world is multi-billions of dollars. And then I begin to think about, we spend about maybe 10 hours a week in there at best, unless you have a preschool or daycare. And if you only have one service a week, you're spending two and a half hours in a building that costs millions. So I'm wondering if that's good stewardship of the earth. And you know what? I've been through a building program. About killed me, but I've been through one. And you know, it's a lot of efforts, a lot of brick, it's a lot of mortar. And and I struggle with talking this way because it could be interpreted as, well, Steve, you're just not you're making excuses because you don't have a building. And it can be perceived that way. And I've beat myself up that way anyway. But I, I thought about The moment that I was in Yosemite Valley with a bunch of pastors, and uh, this was in 2011, pastors from all over the country, there were 20 of us, and we went to Yosemite for the purpose to climb Half Dome and then to have one of the authors of a, a book speak into our life. And so um, 
we went there, we went to Yosemite, we got to play around in the Merced River, we got to hike the little trails, go up uh, into the Muir Trail and watch, look at Mist Falls. I think Michael and Dave, you were with us on one of those trips a few years later. But for this particular trip, I, I was with pastors and, and uh, I said to a couple guys, I, I said, guys, there's a chapel, someone has built a chapel in the Yosemite Valley. How many have ever been there before? To the, how many have ever been to Yosemite before? Okay, so about a half of you. And then in the valley, there's a chapel. It's a beautiful little chapel. It's, it's you know, probably about five of those welcome tents. Beautiful stone. Uh, I think it's got a red roof on it. And I, I remember the words of John Muir. When he was at working in Yosemite, and he said someone came to them, and they suggested that they build a chapel in Yosemite, so when people were at Yosemite, they could go to church. And the words of John Muir is, were this. He felt it was so sacrilegious to put a chapel in this great cathedral. And he said it was almost like putting a little toy model chapel in a great cathedral and asking people to go in there. So I began to think about this, and, and so... Yes, this sermon's going to be out of the box. In fact, it could be just termed out of the box. And I wanted to talk to us today uh, about Earth Day and how we can make the invisible God visible. How many have ever attempted to make the invisible God visible to your friends? You're like, he's real. He's, he's real to me. Can you see him? And they're like, no. <laughs> I mean, that's, isn't that what Thomas was asking? Unless I see the nail prints in his, in his hands, unless I see the scar in his side, unless I see. So a lot of our friends are asking, unless I can see God, I, I can't believe in him. It doesn't make sense to, to believe in something invisible. In fact, I'm making lots of trips to Flagstaff for some reason. I don't know why. Oh, well, the last one, was, I was going on a Grand Canyon tour with uh, Canyon Ministries, and I, every time I drive to Flagstaff on the 40, there's this, um, there's this gold, um, it's not a church, it's, um, what is it? It's a temple, and I'm like, we're driving, and uh, the, all the trees, you get up past Williams, and it's, be you know, once you get past Williams, it's like, it's just beautiful, and it's, you know, the evergreen, or the pines, and it's just, you know, and then you see the peaks, and then you see this distraction, this gold, and I know it's probably wonderful to them, but to me, it was like, why? You know, can you at least hide it a little bit? And it's like the works of man are so distractive to the works of God. And so today, here we go, making the invisible God visible. And that's kind of a a quest that I am on personally, probably for the next 20 years, to help my friends see a visible God that's invisible. And so how do we do that? Ways the invisible God becomes visible. Sometimes the Lord will show you himself through miracles. Through an actual miracle, uh, whether it's a, a hospital miracle or whether it's you're just you're in pain and you ask God to help you, or somebody in a church comes around you and they pray and you, you know, you, you're able to see when you were blind or you had an earache and God ministered to you. Um, those are evident ways that God shows that the, the invisible God shows himself visible when, when he touches you. It's like uh, the blind man when Jesus put mud in his eye. <laughs> Here's some mud in your eye. How do you like that? God's way of making himself visible. And then he could see. Or when the demoniac was in the graveyard, naked and chained and breaking his chains, and Jesus came and delivered him of the demonic presence in his, in his life, and that was a miracle. It was like the, the feeding of the 5,000. That's the invisible God becoming visible. Can I hear you? Are you there? You're tracking with me? All right. It's like turning the water into wine, the invisible God becomes... So he, he, he shows himself through miracles. Another way that God shows himself is that, that people are healed, marriages are healed, um, teenagers 
stop being rebellious or whatever it is that, or you've been healed from inner wounds and God comes and just waves of his love helps you and waves of his grace just helps you and that private pain inside of you has been healed and God will show you his, his invisible attributes visibly by healing your life. Can I hear a good amen? And it's, it's so good, man, when you're healed inside. How many are being healed right now from stuff? God's just working in you. There's also this that, that people are drawn to God by special dreams or they see his love through seemingly coincidental situations, events that happen exactly at the right time moment. It's like it comes out of the blue, but God does something coincidentally in your life. You're like, how did that even happen? And God is working in your life. Still a little bit foggy here, still a little bit invisible, but yet you feel like, you know, you're getting close to seeing him. Archaeology is another great way to see, like you're reading the Bible and you hear about the chariots going through the Red Sea and that how the people of Israel walked through it, but then Egypt came after them and then the Red Sea came on top of them. Or the walls of Jericho, where in archaeology you can actually find chariot wheels in the Red Sea. Remnants of them. You can actually go archaeologically and find the walls of Jericho that crumpled in on each other. I mean, I love that kind of stuff. So archaeology is a way that we as, as humans are trying to find the invisible. So we're looking through scripture and we see this take place. And it's not just some storybook, but you can actually go dig it up. How many? Come on. You can actually go dig it up. Then, you know, we've got the big one, Jesus. Jesus came and he showed the invisible God to be visible because he is the image of God. There's proof right there of visible. And then, and then they, they said, John says, him who we have seen, heard, touched with our own hands. Tangible. How many love a tangible God? Tangible. Okay, so then we got the Bible, 66 books, written over 1,600 years, 40 different offers with one message that God loves you. Bible is a visible it's a visible way, the words of God. It's not just book. It's not just binding. It's the active, living, powerful word of God, Hebrews tells us. And then you've got this one. Uh, this one, have you ever felt like nobody cared? I'm going to keep asking until I see it in that head. Like, sure, like no one's there, that the, the hearts of many wax cold. And then all of a sudden, through some kindness or compassion or generosity, God shows up through someone's kindness. I mean, these guys right here are tools of God's kindness through Samaritan's Purse. That's God showing up, the invisible God showing up visibly. In these ways, God becomes visible. And I love that. I'm just glad he's just not like silent. I mean, I need, I personally, as a person, as a human, I need some kind of activity from heaven. How about you? Don't get all holy on me now, so. I mean, we need something up there. I mean, throw us a bone, God, right? And so he does. He's got all of these evidences. And if we'll just take a moment to look and listen and feel and smell, we can hear and see and touch this invisible God become visible to us. But here's the big one for me. This is the biggie. It is so much easier to talk to people, whether they're Christians, whether they're churched, pre-churched, or de-churched, or churched. It is so much, the pressure is so off, and the answers come so, the questions come so freely when you're God's creation. It's just, it's just night and day. I mean, people clam up when they get in the church. Like you guys are doing right now. It's just clam up. Get you outside around a campfire. Get you outside on a hike. 
Get you outside in one of God's cathedrals and you just start asking questions. I mean, I like, it. I like this, the, the phrase that says, you know, you, if you build a good campfire, everyone becomes a storyteller. Isn't that true? And so, I, what is the dynamic here? Are we missing something? Are we tuning a deaf ear to what God really wants us to experience? And then I think of John Wesley, who is a, you know, Wesley Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards, who were part of the great awakening of the 1700s, where God literally shook the eastern seaboard of the United States through Wesley Whitfield and Edwards. And these guys literally preached on tree stumps. They preached in fields. Rarely did they preach in a building. In fact, Wesley got kicked out of multiple buildings. In one instance, he got kicked out of a building by the deacons. And so he went to go preach in the field, and a cow chased him out of the field. I mean, it's just awesome. If you, if you do a little, little uh, history on Wesley, you'll know that he preached more outside to tens of thousands with no PA system. Just like, oh, Jesus? Who preached more outside than he did in Boxes? How many are excited about today? Are you excited? Come on, let's give the Lord praise because He can speak. He can, he, can, he can do anything. The big one for me, one of the biggest ways the invisible God becomes visible is when I reforest my faith. And it happens every time. It happens every time. I'm in a desert, solitary place, or I'm in a mountain, or by a river yesterday. Uh, some of you know that last Sunday was our last Sunday with Lisa, our worship leader. And man, all blessed week, I'm like, God, what are we going to do? God, what are we going to do? And so I started in my mind to think about how we could restructure the church so that if we didn't have a worship leader, you know, at least we could have church, and then... And then I'm walking in the backyard on my deck, and all of a sudden, a bird started to chirp and sing. And I stopped for a second, and I said, wow, listen to the birds of the air. And it was almost like that bird was singing to me, hey, dummy, I'm going to take care of it. Come on, man. Listen to the birds of the air. Hey, hey, Mr. Smart Guy. Mr. One who tries to figure it all out. Don't worry about it. Even the birds, God even knows the birds and the birds will speak. In fact, Job says, you will learn from the animals. You will learn from the birds of the air. You will learn from nature if you'll just listen. So I was like, yeah. And so it happened every day last week. Now the robins are starting to come out. And I was listening to the robin across the street in the pine tree. And he's like speaking to me and saying, I will be worshipped. God was saying, I will send a musician. I will send it. Come on, come on, man, come on. If you've got goosebumps, you're not alive. You need some red blood. Come on. So one of the biggest ways for me is to make the invisible God visible is through his creation in nature. I like what George Washington Carver said out of Missouri. He said, I love to think of nature as an unlimited broadcasting station, which God speaks to us every hour if we will only tune in. Thoreau said it this way, my profession, my job description is to make and always find God in nature. Nature is all the body of God we mortals will ever see. Frank Lloyd Wright said that. Now, here's the thing. What has happened is that people that don't believe in God have hijacked nature. In other words, what has happened is they have taken that and then they begin to worship nature. They begin to worship the creation, not the creator. And so that's why we get all kind of like there's this tension in the room. Like you start talking about creation. It was like, well, they're worshiping nature. I'll tell you what. Uh, we don't worship creation, but we sure do appreciate it. 
And so this whole issue of the invisible God becoming visible, it just is so much lighter when you're not in a building. We build our buildings and then our buildings build us. They build our theology, they build our view of God, they view everything. And you get us outside the box for a second, just look at the magnificent creation of God and our minds are blown, at least expanded. So let's look at scripture then, okay? You get, are you okay with that? Enough of what I think and enough of what those guys think. Let's, let's talk about scripture and making the invisible God visible. Colossians 1, uh, verses 15 through 17, two verses out of the NIV. The Son is the image of the invisible God. We're talking about Jesus. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and things, say it with me, on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things are held together. We're spinning at thousands of miles an hour, yet it's still held together. I'm talking about the trees are not uprooted from the earth because we're going so fast around the sun. I thought it was interesting the other day, I was listening to Matthew, Matthew Sleeth, who's written a book called Reforesting Your Faith. I did a series on it a couple uh, years ago, and actually we've got a dozen pastors on a Zoom call uh, this Tuesday at 11 o'clock, Matthew Sleeth, Dr. Sleeth, talking about reforesting your faith. And so there's kind of this movement in the ministry right now of people going, you know what, there's more to this than just the box. There's a movement that's happening. And he was, I was listening to his book for the third time as I was reforesting my faith on a walk. And he said that if you look and cut a tree, how many know there's rings in the tree? And my granddaughter and I are we're attempting, we're writing a book together. And she's nine. <laughs> and so I'm asking her to put together her, her chapters. And her first chapter that she wrote is Trees Have Birthdays Too. And I'm like, whoa. And I'm asking her to draw. It's going to be a picture book because I'm pretty simple. <laughs> and, uh, and she says, Tree, trees have birthdays too, Papa Bear. And this is my first chapter. And she drew the rings of a tree. And I went, wow, that's true. I've known that my whole life. And she said, every time... The earth goes around the sun. A tree gets another ring. Come on. Now that little nine-year-old child is, is learning theology through a tree. I think I would rather have her doing that than learning theology from a flannel board Jesus. How many of you were raised on flannel board Jesuses? Come on, let's shout. The flannel board Jesus is in a box, a room, probably a musty Sunday school room down in the basement, of which I went to. And you got a star for bringing your Bible. You got a star for bringing your tithe. You got a star for being in attendance. You got a star for. Uh, uh, and so then, the, and oh, Sister Barry, she was awesome. I loved her. She gave me my first Bible. But, she, you know, the flannel board, and there's the little Jesus and the marching. I wish I had one right now. And a little sheep, and there's the disciples there. And I'm looking at the flannel board as a five-year-old going, I don't understand. What the... You take a child outside, and you let her worship the Lord through the creation that the Lord made, and there's nothing better. He is the invisible, he is the visible of what is invisible. Jesus is. So he created everything on, say that with me, on, and 
in, on earth and in heaven. He did it. So God, wake us up in our boxes to look at what you've created on and what you created in because it's amazing. Secondly, um, Genesis 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and then he said, you're welcome. <laughs> it's not in the scripture, I put it in there, so... I, I, well, I looked at, uh, we went to the Redwoods a few years back, and I, I looked at the Redwoods, these magnificent trees. Thank God that John Muir and Teddy said, nope, that's it, you're not cutting any more down. It's just going to burn in the San Francisco fire anyway. So we're walking through there, and I'm thinking, and God created the Redwoods, and he said, you're welcome. And God created the Grand Canyon, and he said, no problem. Can we acknowledge him every once in a while? How long has it been since you walked past a stream and said, thank you? It will really do something in your spirit if you walk, just hold, you know, touch a tree, man. In the, I think we've got a couple of them here in Prescott National Forest. Touch it and say, thank you, God. See what happens in your spirit. I mean, we have a hard enough time thanking him for our lunch. What about just acknowledging him that in the beginning God created everything and then he said, you're welcome. And, and it's, a hollow, it's a hollow thank you from the human race. Just take it for granted. Thirdly, the heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. So we're talking about the glory and the work. The heavens declare the glory. How many of you have looked outside of your yard and you've seen the Milky Way lately? About 2 o'clock. I mean, actually, about from 11. If you, it just, you get out. I remember our Lake Powell trip we took a few years back, and I had to get up you know, at 2 o'clock, as old guys do, and, and I, I, I looked out, and I could not believe what I saw. I'm like, this is, this is another universe. The heavens declare the glory of the Lord, <laughs> and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. And if you look at the Milky Way, and you're like, we're just a speck in the Milky Way, let alone, then the Milky Way is a speck in the universe. And then we just go, okay, I got to go. I'm tired. How about a big thank you? How about like, wow, you're amazing. I declare with the skies, I proclaim with the heavens that you're amazing. Ethan was wor uh, playing, doing worship today, and I, I thought, wouldn't it be cool as he's singing that song that while he's singing that, and then Mark is on the cajon, that, <laughs> I know you guys are going to think, whoa. <laughs> Wouldn't it be cool that if from behind the curtain, people from every tribe and every nation would just begin to march out and begin to sing with him? Then my mind went a little bit crazier and thought, wouldn't it be great behind every tribe and every nation represented while Ethan's just playing this, angelic beings came behind them and began to sing. I'm like, whoa. I think our people would, these, you would be blown away. But in the, in the heavenlies, in the spiritual realm, that's happening all the time. If we had the ability just to look two feet above us in the spiritual realm, we would be amazed at the spiritual beings that are helping us, worshiping God with us, praying for us, ministering to us, ministering angels. Come on, how many of you want to look up? Look up for your redemption draws an eye. It's different. So acknowledge him, the glory and the work that he's done. The word glory from the Latin gloria means fame and renown. Fame and renown. 
it, it means it, it, it's used to describe the manifestation of the presence of God as we can perceive him as humans. In other words, nature, the skies make him famous to me. He's renowned to me. Because this falls short. But that does not. How many, how many are tracking? Yeah, with your tree-hugging pastor. Yeah, I know. So glory in the work. Number four, there's no excuse, but did you miss it? There's no excuse. All the humans on the earth, eight billion of us have no excuse because God's given us the invisible as something that is visible. There's no excuse to not believe in him. None. There's no excuse to not believe in the creator God. I, I, we could use a good amen there in the church world. There is no excuse. If you'll just stop, listen, look, smell, taste, and touch. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. There's no excuse because he has made the invisible visible. Romans 1.20, the famous passage that says, For since the creation of the world... God, say it with me, invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. Being understood from what has been made so that men are, you know, so ne next time one of your buddies, your friend that you love, say, I just can't believe in God. Say, well, good luck with all that. <laughs> I'm serious. At some point in time, we got to quit, like, walking on eggshells. I'm sorry, I didn't tell you don't believe. Well, I'm like, open your eyes, dude. Oh, you offended me. Well, that's too bad. You're without excuse. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Are we so brilliant that we have it all figured out in human terms? They think they are. I think one of the reasons that people won't acknowledge God of creation is because it takes humility to do that. And there's too much pride in the human soul. Yeah. Because if I acknowledge that God created it all, oh, then I've got to be humble. Yeah. How many glad you came today? No excuses. Did you miss it? I like what uh, Frank Borum says. Frank... Uh, uh, Billy Graham says if he only had two books to read, he'd read the Bible, and he'd have all of Frank Graham's volumes. Uh, Frank was a pastor in Tasmania from England. He listened to Spurgeon preach. He listened to Moody preach. He listened to famous guys in England's preach, and then they shipped him off to Tasmania and to Australia to, to pastor uh, a couple of churches. He writes this, and, and in his book called A Bunch of Everlastings, uh, Frank writes this, God writes everywhere and on everything. God is the most voluminous author in the universe. Every leaf in the forest, every sand in the seashore is smothered with God's handwriting. The trouble is that I am so slow to recognize the manuscripts of God. Man, how many just right now are like, God, man, wake, my, wake me up. Give, give, let me be wide awake to your presence. Colossians 1.16 says, Jesus is the key to the universe. We could stop right there and like have all scientists and everybody try to figure just that out. He's the key to the universe. All things have been uh, created through him. Now, let me just say this, and we're going to wrap this up and land the plane, but it's the universe, not a universe. You know there are so many universes right now? There's the gaming universe. You know, like gaming, what, it's, it's not like this, the gaming universe. That's a universe. Uh, mountain biking is a universe. Hiking is a universe. Um, um, church world is a universe. Uh, we can become so like enthralled with church world. It's like a vortex. It's a universe. Um, there's, there's movie, what Netflix has and Prime Video has, what are these called, these like series things? Um, I won't mention them because then you'll know I'm watching them, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, you, they're, they're these series and that's their own universe. I mean, you can get stuck in that universe for like two years. Come on, don't get all holy on me. What? 
Yes, yes. Uh, comic books, uh, gaming. It's this whole universe that takes up your whole time. You know that, that uh, seminaries can be a whole universe. But the, the scripture says that he is the key to a universe. The universe. What is the universe? The universe is not just the Milky Way. I'd say we need to give more attention to Jesus than we do. Yeah. Instead of our own universes. You know, we gather here once a week to worship and they will acknowledge that there is a throne in heaven and we're not on it. We come here and we gather to worship at least once a week to acknowledge that there is a center of the universe and we're not it. So he's the key to the universe, not a universe. How many, are living, how many have ever lived in a universe before? How many of your universes have changed? Huh? You had this little hobby universe over here? I was thinking through those universes the other day that I went through, and I won't tell you about them because it would embarrass me. But the universe of this, I was like really into that for like 10 years or five years, and I went to this universe over here. And how many have universes? You know, well, if you elect Jesus be the key to that universe, you'll probably get rid of that universe because it's not really worthy. Okay? But the universe? Oh, my word. Oh, oh. Oh, wow. Acts 7.48 nails it. Here we go. This is, this is like, get, it's going to get nailed right here. Ready? Acts 7.48 says, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of the heavens and the earth and does not dwell and temples built with human hands. Oh. Ah. Uh. Oh. And even the temples that we do build with human hands are kind of like shabby. Especially in church world. You know why? Because we have no budget. <laughs> I remember working two years on a building. We built a 10,000 square foot building for 30 bucks a square foot. And it was blood, sweat, and tears. A few of us had some time, hardly any talent. And I can remember we, we kind of finished it. And then we had a dedication. And I remember people coming from the community and other churches. I was walking down the hall. I was a little bit proud. You know, yeah, 30 bucks a square foot, man. 10,000 square foot. We've got carpet. We didn't have any money, but we got it done. And I remember walking in past this one room, and I heard a guy going, why in the heck did they do it that way? I about went in there and grabbed him by the throat and said, because we didn't have any money. Why didn't you come and help us? And what he was saying was, what he was saying was, it was kind of shabby. And I got to tell you, our, our greatest effort our greatest effort to build a temple or a building is kind of shabby in comparison to the glory and the work and the splendor of the Lord. So why would we want to put a little box inside a big, gigantic cathedral? You're like, Pastor, you've lost your mind. Because you're not going to hear this kind of message, but i got to tell you, there ain't no turning back for this guy. No turning back. Because God is much bigger than our boxes. He's much bigger than our programs. He's much bigger. And I know you know that. I'm just reminding you. So next time you get out there, hopefully today, I think Chris said, we need to get out there more. I'm like, thank you, Jesus, for some reason. The God who made the world and everything in it. And here's the thing. It's amazing to me how the gospel is so freely received out there. But if I bring, if I drag, come here, Chris, you're, you're a good candidate. Sorry, you two people. So if I, like, if I drag, resist me, come on. If I drag him in, get in here, man. You get in here. 
<laughs> Sinner, you get out of here. Now sit down. You listen to me preach. If I drag him, there's this resistance. It's this resistance. But if I've been with him at Fossil Creek. And I've, you know, we just, we just, hey, we're just us. And you don't put this religious cloak on our setting. So if I were to say to Chris, take me on the river. See, look at that. He's like, yeah, yeah. Shake his head. See? It's a difference there. Now, I'm, I'm giving you this today to know, let you know this. The thing that you're feeling inside that you want to get out of the box, God put it in there. You didn't, it's not like being rebellious against God. God put it in you. And so go ahead and do it. And then when you're out there, understand that people will be more receptive to Jesus who created this whole thing than if you bring him in a box that you built with your own hands. And while you're out there, go ahead and, and be free to say, you know, it, words like this. Don't Christianize them to death. Words like this. Man, isn't this, isn't this creation just amazing? And if you, were, if you use the word creation, some of the smart ones would go, but you didn't use evolution. Isn't this evolution amazing? But just go ahead and throw the word creation in there. Because behind creation is a creator. If you uh, use words that resonate, it's called the dialect of, those, of, a dialect of that setting. You'll be amazed how that this doesn't fit into that but that fits into this. Nature and creation fits into this. And I'll say that um, God left fingerprints everywhere. Everywhere. The galaxy shouted out, he is there. The wildflowers sing it together, especially in the spring, in the desert, and they sing it and he is there. The rippling brooks of which we all love, we saw yesterday, God shouts and he sings in the rippling brooks, he's there. The birds sing it, the lions roar it, the fish in the ocean, they swim it, he's there, he's there. All of creation joins and sings the praises of the Lord. The heavens declare it, the earth repeats it, day after day, day after day. The wind whispers it. He's there. Deep calls out to deep. The mighty sequoia trees tell of the ancient that created it. The eagle who soars overhead. The lion and the lamb and the wolf all agree that he made it all. He made it all. So here's your challenge. You go out this week and make the invisible God visible. Do it. Through kindness, through your words, through deeds, not being critical, by having compassion, by like taking a hike with someone and expressing how much you love creation and the Creator. Go out on your deck and lay on your back and look up and praise him until the, the neighbors call the cops and say, there's a loon out there. <laughs> praise him with your mouth. Love him. Experience him. Make the invisible God visible this week. Hey, let's stand together. Thanks, Chris. Don't let me drag you into church here. Awesome. How many, how many get it? You feeling that? Afterwards, after the service, you can feel free to come up to me and say, you are totally whacked, you heresy. You're a heretic, you're whacked. Go ahead, that's fine. But I will tell you this, I'll tell, I can serve Jesus, I can serve him in a church building, but I sure am free to praise him outside. I love it. It's Earth Day weekend. That's why we did the Verde River yesterday, just kind of like, oh, yeah. Okay. Um, 
in June, we will be going to uh, our annual event that got canceled two years in a row. One because of the Koof Koof and one because of the forest fires. But this year we'll be at Mingus at the playground area for three days. So I would encourage you to, 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 to Google it, find out where it is, plan on it. If, you don't, if you're not a person of, uh, of sleeping on the ground, that's fine. There is a place for you to bring a camper. You can car camp if you want. You can put yourself in a tent or you can uh, rent a, you can drive up. It's only what, 40 minutes, 35 minutes from your house to Mingus. So we'll be there Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night. And we encourage you to be there uh, for an event we call STARS. In a moment just to quiet ourselves, to listen, to get out of the buzz and the noise and connect with each other and the Creator. And then in August, mid-August, we're headed to the North Rim for two nights. And we'd encourage you to be a part of that as well, okay? So grab an event this year and participate. Hey, how many would love to know the real Jesus Christ who created it all? You'd love to know. Yeah. Let's just for a second say, you know, let's just for a second say, God, I want to know you. I want to know you. I want to know you, Jesus. Would you lift up your hands to him and say, God, I just really want to know you. I want to get to know you more. God, as we worship you and praise you, yes, angels just a couple of feet above us in the spiritual realm are worshiping with us, singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty around your throne, God. Oh, God, in heaven, all the things on the earth we can see, but in heaven there's a river. In heaven there are trees. In fact, your throne faces a tree. Oh, man, we should look at that. Father, we thank you today for your creation that you gave us to enjoy and to steward and to point people to you through it. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Come on, let's give God praise for his beautiful creation. Amen. Can we give it up for Pastor Steve real quick? I love, I love his heart about nature and doors, outdoors and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I'm not going to preach again, don't worry. But one time I was sitting in a Safeway parking lot. There's this giant rainbow that goes all the way, all the way across the sky. Um, and I, I remember just watching every single person that walked out of Safeway that day. I'm sitting there waiting for my wife to finish shopping. And it didn't matter. Every single person had that same reaction. Whoa. Whoa, whoa. It's, it's so incredibly in our face all the time. And maybe you're not an outdoorsy type person. Uh, that's, that's cool. That's fine. Uh, I think the heart behind this is, is let's appreciate what God has created but also, let's not limit ourselves to what we think church should look like, and what we think church should be, because there's so much more out there. And so, man, I just encourage you, uh, maybe you haven't done an outdoors trip before, and maybe you're like a city folk. That's cool. We love you. God bless you. I don't know how you found us. <laughs> but I challenge you, man, let's... Let's get outside. Let's try it. And I, I dare you to see if God doesn't show you something that blows your mind. So we're done here today. And uh, thank you so much for coming. You could be doing anything on your Sunday afternoon. And uh, the fact that you carved out a little time on a Sunday morning to come spend with us means the world to us. If, if you like the heartbeat behind Discovery Church, if you want more information or how to get involved, come find me afterwards. I'd love to have a conversation with you. If you'd like to partner with us, there's ways for you to do that. The number one way is to partner through prayer. Uh, we encourage you partner by getting involved. And if you'd like to partner with us financially uh, for us to be able to facilitate some of these things, Man, we'd love for you to do that as well. There's buckets over on the discovery table over there. 
um, that you can partner with us in that way. You can give online. And so I'm going to pray, and then we're going to go home. And Pastor Steve's probably going to say something about tacos and go for a hike. See, I nailed it. God, thank you so much for creating everything. God, thank you for putting us in a world of beauty. That we're not trapped in the confines of concrete. And that we're not stuck in a rigid structure of what church should be. God, thank you that that creation shouts your glory. And God, I pray that this week you give us opportunities to join in the song and sing along with creation. We love you so very much. We thank you for what you're doing in and through our church. We pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you, Al, for coming, and we'll see you next time.